Welcome to the Jackson Rudolph Podcast. I am your host, Jackson Rudolph, and this is episode 10, Birthday Boy. And it is not Birthday Boy because I'm going to spend the entire episode talking about my birthday. However, uh, I did just turn 22 years old, and I want to say a huge thank you to everybody that reached out and took the time to send me a personal message or make a post. Uh, It truly means the world to me. I'm honored, humbled, and extremely blessed and grateful um, to be able to receive as much um, as many happy birthday wishes as I did, and I just want to thank everybody that took, took the time to reach out uh, very much for doing that. But the episode, despite the title being Birthday Boy, is not about my birthday. It's more so just, you know, turning 22 and wanting to, to look back and reflect on some of my favorite memories from my career in sport karate because it's it's one of those things where as you get older you start to you know obviously gain more and more memories and it's something that you love to reflect on or at least something that I love to reflect on as I move later and later in my career and as I get older and as I move into this transition phase in life where at some point I'm going to be going to medical school and all that. And so it's just, it's enjoyable and it's fun to me, for me to reflect. And so that's one of the, one of the things I want to do today. So there won't be a story time today because the, uh, the entire discussion is going to be the, the story time, uh, by going over some of these memories. One of the first things that I want to get to uh, before we get into that discussion, though, is congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs and all of their fans on winning the Super Bowl. Um, I personally wasn't overly impressed with any single player. Uh, like, I honestly thought that maybe like Damian Williams, who's the running back for the Chiefs, I thought maybe he should have won MVP because, you know, Mahomes wound up winning it. Mahomes had two interceptions early in the game. I believe they were both in the first half. Second half, he did come back and throw two touchdowns. Uh, He had the one deep pass to Tyreek Hill that wound up leading to the touchdown, but that touchdown was thrown to Damian Williams. Damian Williams would also wind up having the rushing touchdown that would seal it. So I just thought because of Mahomes not being overly spectacular um, and because of the fact that Damian Williams was kind of consistent throughout the whole game, caught the touchdown that he had to reach over the pylon and make that play, as well as the game ceiling rush for the touchdown. I could have seen him winning the MVP, but I get it. Mahomes was the play caller. Mahomes was the guy that had to be able to bounce back in the second half and actually deliver those touchdowns after delivering the interceptions. So I see it both ways. Um, and another thing that I noticed is this is what happens because I've been a football fan for a long time. As long as I've been watching sports, I've been a football fan. So probably, you know, since I was seven or eight years old watching the Jets with my granddad. Um, but this is what happens when young players and in particular young quarterbacks are a little bit afraid of the moment. Now, we saw it really bad last year with Jared Goff. Jared Goff, somebody that wasn't ready for the moment, tightened up, laid an egg in the Super Bowl, and the Patriots blew out the Rams, right? But in this case, we see two young quarterbacks in Jimmy Garoppolo and in Patrick Mahomes. Obviously, Mahomes younger than Garoppolo. And I thought they both looked a little bit tight from the get-go. You know what I mean? Jimmy Garoppolo is more of a game manager in general, sets up the running game for San Francisco. But even when he was passing, it just didn't... It didn't look like the the smooth Jimmy Garoppolo that I've seen before in the games that San Francisco tends to dominate. Um, he just didn't. He didn't look comfortable. And in the first half, at least, Patrick Mahomes didn't look very comfortable either. Uh, a lot of balls getting underthrown. A lot of balls with a little bit of a tail on them, not a perfect spiral. They just looked a little bit tight. And I was just thinking, like that's something that you never see from Brady. Either of the Manning brothers when they've been in Super Bowls. Going back and watching film of John Elway, Joe Montana. Like, those guys were always ready for the moment. You know, and and that's one thing that I, I remember talking about in a couple of episodes ago on the podcast. Talking about how in preparation for the AKA Warrior Cup, you shouldn't just treat it like another tournament. You should appreciate and you should respect the prestige of what you're going to compete in. And I kind of feel like that's how the Super Bowl is. Like, if you make it to the Super Bowl, it's not worth it to be afraid of the moment at that point. Like, at that point, you need to, you know, puff your chest out, lift your chin up, and go out there and try to own it because you're going for a chance to win the most prestigious title in all of sports. You know what I mean? Like, a Super Bowl championship is right up there with Olympic gold medal and everything else so it's like why would you not just go out there and own it and I understand people get nervous and you know maybe not everybody's wired the way I am but to me I thought both of these young quarterbacks uh, looked a little bit tight but 
that makes it all the more exciting to see how they grow, how they develop. You know, I feel like this is not the last Super Bowl that Mahomes will play in. I feel like it's probably not the last Super Bowl that Patrick Mahomes will win. So I'm excited to see kind of how um, both of these teams, both of these quarterbacks especially, develop over the next several years. Also with Kyle Shanahan being a young coach, seeing what he does with that San Francisco offense over the next couple of years. Um, It'll be exciting to watch. So anyway, now we're going to go ahead and dive into the main discussion section, which is going to be reflecting on some of these cool memories that I've had in Sport Karate. But first, a quick message from the Flow Weapon System, which on my birthday celebrated its second anniversary. So the Flow Weapon System is a one-of-a-kind weapons program. It's been around for two years now, featuring two complete weapons programs, a bow staff program featuring myself, Jackson Rudolph, and a comma program featuring Mackenzie Emery. The Flow System features dynamic forms, instructor training, a private interactive Facebook group where if you ever have any questions, there's also going to be bonus content that's consistently uploaded onto the Facebook group. The Flow Weapon System is changing the game when it comes to a weapons program. You can head on over to theflowsystem.tv to check it out today. And now we're going to jump right in to reflecting on some of these cool memories that I've had in sport karate. I'm going to do a little bit of storytelling here. I'll go into some spe- specifics. We're going to start kind of from a from a zoom out perspective, and then we're going to kind of get more detailed as I go through some of these memories. By the way, be prepared for a little bit shorter episode today. Uh, at the cur- at the moment, it is 12:52 a.m. California time. Uh, trying to get this podcast out for you guys uh, after the birthday weekend. I spent the, my birthday in Monterey. Uh, at the aquarium there, which I love going to aquariums and zoos and and seeing wildlife. I just love, that's one of my favorite things. Gabrielle flew in. We had a great time. Uh, Friends came with me to Monterey. It was was just an awesome day and an awesome weekend. Had Super Bowl party today in addition to also getting some school work done, some professional work done, all of that to get ready for this week uh, starting on Monday. Uh, I also just recently entered a lab that's doing research uh, on neurology during sleep. So looking at uh, brain activity during sleep in patients that have depression or patients that have obsessive compulsive disorder and studying that. So I've got my hands in a whole lot of different baskets right now. But now we're going to go ahead and jump on into this discussion for some of the some of these cool moments that I've had in sport karate. So one of the first things that I want to reflect on is just the blessings that I've had and where I've been able to travel. So this is what I said, kind of starting from the zoom out, and then we'll get more detailed. Uh, But I have taught or performed in Canada, Guatemala, Ireland, Hungary, Spain, India, the Cayman Islands, and Australia. And, And just looking back on that, like literally being able to travel the world and do what I love, whether it's performing for others, whether it's sharing my knowledge with others through seminars and trying to inspire the next generation, I mean, that's just something that's truly special. And I'm, I'm a firm believer in investing in your experiences and the experiences that I've had being able to go to these different places and meet new people and see different styles of martial arts and train different people in the style of martial arts that I know and being able to, to help people all over the world get better at bow staff in particular. It's just something that, that's so special and that I'll never, ever take for granted. Um, and so now zooming in and getting more detailed, I want to talk about a particular story, which was the Cayman Islands trip. So the Cayman Islands trip was not a solo trip. A lot of the business that I do is, you know, me flying somewhere and teaching the seminar, me flying somewhere and doing the demonstration or competing in the tournament, what have you. A lot of what I do is is solo business. But when I went to the Cayman Islands, that was actually a team trip that we went on with Team Paul Mitchell. And one of the most memorable moments of that whole trip was the entire team basically rented out this boat uh, for this charter, and we went out to what's called Stingray City. Now, Stingray City, this tour was two-part. We started with like a little snorkeling thing in this reef uh, right off the coast, uh, and that was really cool. And that's actually where the main story that I'm going to tell takes place, and then the main uh part of the trip we were actually going out to this big sandbar where like literally hundreds of stingrays giant stingrays huge stingrays like the size of of a full-grown man's back um were all were everywhere and so what you do is you go out on the sandbar and as long as you don't step on them they're not aggressive you can feed the stingrays the stingrays swim up to you you can hold them they lay on your back they're super friendly really really cool experience but that's not what the story's about i remember one of the most fun parts of that whole trip was um, 
we had just finished the snorkeling, and the tour guide had found a uh, a fresh conch down at the uh, down at the bottom of the you know down on the seafloor, and he had taken this conch and he literally like took the conch out of the shell, which a lot of people think of like the conch is just like the shell that you listen to and you hear the ocean in. A lot of people don't realize that a conch is an actual shellfish, like there's an animal that lives inside those shells. Um, and so what he did was he the tour guide took the conch out. I sliced it up so it was raw, fresh, literally straight out of the ocean conch, sliced it all up, and then he had like tomatoes and onions and he had all these ingredients, and he actually made a conch salsa right there in front of us, and that was just the coolest thing, like he made a fresh like sashimi almost conch salsa right in front of us, and it wasn't served with like tortilla chips, it was served with like saltine crackers, and I remember as we went from the reef where we were snorkeling to the actual sandbar where Stingray City was, I remember sitting on that boat with Cass Sigmund, and we just tore through like an entire tub of this freshly made conch salsa. A lot of a lot of the other members of the team were scared to eat it because it's like just came out of the water, so they were kind of sketch about it. But Cass Sigmund and I, we went to town with saltine crackers and uh, and salsa. Uh, con- freshly made conch salsa and that's just one of the most vivid just wholesome memories that I have from that whole trip and then obviously being out in the water with the stingways was really cool and getting to see how like you know all these different like tough guy martial artists and fighters and everything reacted you know to stingrays climbing on them and everything so that was a really cool trip uh, now kind of zooming back out going big picture uh, some other really cool memories that I have uh, are some of the demos that I've done with Team Paul Mitchell you know traveling to children's hospitals we've done that in Atlanta uh, Washington DC we've done it at the Hasbro Children's Hospital um, in Rhode Island uh, those are just such cool events I remember uh, when we were at Emory University at their at their uh, medical center uh, in the pediatric department we actually got to go in. Uh, and deliver some presents to some of the kids there and be able to actually spend some one-on-one time with the kids in addition to doing the martial arts demonstration. So that was really cool. Uh, Same thing with Rhode Island School for the Deaf. Uh, Last year at Ocean State Grand Nationals, we did demonstration for them, which was really cool. Um, I mentioned doing demos in D.C. We've also demoed before at the Walter Reed Medical Center, which is the... um, one of the main military medical centers in the United States, uh, based in Washington, D.C. Um, and one of my, zooming back in, one of my more detailed stories from these demos actually comes from that trip. So because it's on a, med- because it's on a military base, because it's a military hospital, we pull up to the little security tower where they, you know, let you in. And, um, the guy at the security tower is like, well, we can't have any weapons coming into the facility. So literally, like, everybody that had weapons had to leave their weapons, like, up here at the front. And so me, being the weapon specialist, not being a guy that does fighting drills, not being a guy that does empty hand and flips and all that, is now going in to do a demonstration, and I don't have what I demonstrate with, right? So this this was a little intimidating at first. And this was... I had, I'd been on the team a little while, but I hadn't been on the team super long. I'd maybe been on the team two or three years when this demo happened. But anyway, so and it's all, whenever we go and do demos, it's all the executive staff that can make it. So it's Coach Rodriguez, you know, Lauren, if she can come, uh, Coach Rappold, Coach Damon, uh, Coach Steve. Like all the executives are there, and then as many of the team members as can make it are there. Um, and so everybody's watching, you know, in addition to the, the people that you're trying to entertain. In this case, uh, we're veterans trying to heal from battle wounds, things like that, um, post-traumatic stress disorder patients, things, things of that nature. And... Um, so we get into this gymnasium that the hospital had, um, which was kind of in like a more residential part of the hospital where people that were doing like long-term recovery were being housed and things like that. And um, so we go into this gymnasium and everybody's, you know, getting ready to do their thing. And like me being the only guy that's like, Bo is what I do. You know what I mean? Like I could go out there and do a traditional form, but I don't know if like these veterans want to see me do a traditional form. You know what I'm saying? And so we're in the gym and everybody's warming up. And I notice in the corner of the gym, they have like this eight or nine foot long PVC pipe with a tennis ball on the end of it that they had used to like knock the basketball off of the goal when it would get stuck up there. And I was like, oh my God, this is perfect. And so I go over and I like grab this piece of PVC pipe. I kick the tennis ball off the end of it. And I have like an eight or nine foot long bow staff that I'm now going to do a demo with. 
which doesn't sound super crazy other than the fact that it's long. But one thing that you learn when you try to do bow with a piece of PVC pipe is that it is not rigid whatsoever. Like as soon as you try to strike with a piece of PVC pipe, it like bends and it's like super flexible and it's like vibrating all over the place. When you throw the bow in the air because it's such a light material, it doesn't really come back down to you. So it's just floating up there. So your timing is all different. Um, so I was able to warm up with this for like maybe two and a half minutes before it was time to do the demo. I told the coaches, I was like, hey, I found this PVC pipe, I can do it. And I wasn't expecting them to be totally on board. I was expecting them to kind of be like, eh, that's a little weird. I don't know if we should do that. But then they were like, oh, no, that's dope. Go for it. Uh, and so I still remember going out there and I did like a full form with this like eight or nine foot long PVC pipe with the pipe flinging all over the place and, you know, vibrating. And I mean, that, that was just such a fun demo to do because it was so spontaneous and so fun. Uh, and especially an honor being able to perform for the veterans and especially ones that, that are healing and trying to, to overcome hard times. That was just a super, super cool experience. And that's certainly a demo that I will never forget. Moving on to uh, another one of the, kind of those those broad scope memories. Uh, early in my days of being on Paul Mitchell, uh, being in some of those Paul Mitchell team meetings as the generation shift was happening. So I remember like the first Diamonds meeting that I was a part of was in 2012. And in that meeting, I mean, there's so much greatness in that like one meeting. And I, I'm definitely going to leave out people, but like Austin Crane was on the team at that time. Austin Jorgensen was on the team at that time. But I remember like being in a team meeting with Matt Emig, you know, is just the coolest thing in the world. You know what I mean? Because Matt is one of the greatest competitors of all time. So I was in team meetings with Matt Emig. Matt would have been more so at US Open when I first got on the team because I think he was retired by Diamonds that year. Um, but anyway... At that Diamonds, uh, being on the team with Chelsea Nash, when Chelsea Nash was in the middle of that huge win streak of diamond rings. I don't even remember how many diamond rings it was that she won in a row, but some ridiculous amount of women's fighting diamond rings in a row. I was with Chelsea Nash when she was kind of at the end of that streak. That was super cool, being able to see her in the team meetings. Uh, Alex Lane was on the team fighting back then, and I know he's come back recently at a couple of tournaments and done some fights in the 30-plus division, uh, but back when Alex was, was more in his prime, and you know, he was fast lane, you know what I mean? And being able to to see Alex like that, and guys like Greg Betlock and Elias Lemon, uh, and just so many others. That's when Cass Sigmund was first on the team. That's when Justin Ortiz first got on the team. And just being in some of those early team meetings was so special to see that previous generation and be part of that shift to the new generation. Like, I still remember... I was on the team when we first went and got the Hungarians. When we recruited Zolt and Laszlo, who were the first two Hungarians that we signed, I still remember being on the team when all of that was happening, when all of that was being discussed, and when those moves were being made. And that's one thing that's crazy to me is that, like, right now, I'm the longest tenured active member of Paul Mitchell, like, of the people that are sponsored and traveling and doing all the events. I'm the longest tenured member, and that's, like, crazy to me, just this journey and and just how special it's been and how blessed I've been and some of the competitors that I've been able to come up with. It's just, uh, it's unbelievable and it's surreal sometimes. And being able to watch that shift into the new generation after we picked up the Hungarians, then we picked up some more Hungarians, and then, you know, Zolt was winning the Irish Open and being able to watch us in team fights and that being electric. And then also watching us kind of rebuild our team in the juniors, picking up guys like Jake Presley, picking up guys like Danny Edkin and Aiden Considine who are now in the adult division, but we picked up as juniors where we added Reed to the team, where we added... Uh, Mackenzie Emery and Tyler Weaver to the team before those guys. Uh, the addition of Sammy, the addition of Cole Presley, just being able to watch all of these guys get added to the team and watch the team go from one generation of dominant athletes and then completely change into this new generation is just something truly special that I, uh, I'm i really blessed to have been able to watch and to have been able to be a part of uh, and have a first-person perspective on that shift. And so now we're going to kind of go back into some of the more detailed stories here. Um, and these are just some of the, like when I was thinking, of, man, what are the coolest things that I remember about, you know, this 22 years that I've been on this planet and the, the, the 15 years that I've been in martial arts or 15 years that I've been in sport karate, 16 years that I've been in martial arts. Um, and one of the first one, uh, the first two really are two U.S. Open interview stories. So I remember 2010 was the first year that I won U.S. Open. I was representing the Premier Martial Arts National Karate Team. Now, before that U.S. Open, I had not won 
uh, I had won one overall in my career. I won the Compete Nationals overall grand and then the gold medallion round, which is a different story for a different day. But that was a really cool win when Compete had that extra gold medallion round. Um, so my only career overall win was winning that gold medallion at the Compete Nationals. And so going into U.S. Open, I didn't really have any expectations. I always wanted to be on U.S. Open stage. I always wanted to, to try to earn my way to get up there, but it being an invitational finals and me only having one overall grand of my name, I didn't know if it was going to be possible, but I really, really wanted it to happen. So I remember during the Friday eliminations, uh, Mike Chat had been doing the, uh, the, uh, the interviews and the commentating for a couple of years at that point. And so everybody knew that he was the commentator. He was the interview guy for ESPN and everything. And I remember on Friday night, before any decisions had been made, because a lot of people don't realize this. Like now, U.S. Open does a little bit better job of like everybody knowing beforehand who's going to be on stage and, and what. And obviously, there's still wild cards and thing like, things like that that happen. But used to, it was a lot more stressful. Like I remember the U.S. Open several years ago where people would literally get told they were going to be on stage two hours before the night show and then half an hour before the night show get told, eh, we're going a different direction, which I understand. It's business. It's trying to put together the best show. Things like that happen. And I just thought that's how it would always be. But over the past several years, U.S. Open's done a much better job of, uh, of people kind of knowing beforehand and being able to be prepared. There's a lot more media coverage that ESPN does leading up to the finals, which I think helps solidify some of that, which is really cool. But anyway, back then, things were not so certain. Uh, in 2010 especially, things were not so certain. And so... Friday night eliminations, Mike Chat walks up to me. And he, he and I had talked to Mike Chat maybe two or three times in my life before this and like, hello sir, how are you? That type of thing. And Mike Chat comes up to me and he's like, Hey Jackson. And I'm like, Hey Mr. Chat. And he's like, What question do you want me to ask you tomorrow night after you win the US Open? And I'm like, like, sir, I don't even know if I'm gonna be on stage yet. Like, am I on stage? Is that he's like, No, 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 like that's not decided yet. But you know, like, I believe in you and, um, you know, what do you want me to ask you? And I don't even remember what I told him at this point, but I just remember like being like so, so shook, so, so surprised and, and so proud at the same time. And the fact that like that Mike chat would have that kind of faith in me that I was going to be able to like, not just get on stage, but actually be able to win. So that was a super cool moment. And then obviously actually going into the U S open on Saturday, uh, being told that I was going to be on stage, being able to actually win my first U.S. Open that Saturday night and then get interviewed by Mike Chat. That was just a super cool uh, experience. And then actually a little bit cooler of an experience was, uh, I believe the year was, was it 2017? No, 2016. It was my last year as a junior, whatever my last year as a junior was. Anyway, I'm getting old. I don't remember these things. But anyway, uh, my last year as a junior, um, I had probably the best statistical U.S. Open that I've ever had. Um, they did a traditional weapons ISKA title that year, which I won. They did the CMX ISKA weapons title, which I won that year, um, as well as the SYNC title, which I won uh, I believe when I was a junior, that was the last time that I did it with Kyle Montagna. So I won that sync title with Kyle Montagna that year before I moved up to adults and started doing it with Jake. But anyway, so I won three ISKA titles in one night, which I believe ties a record with a couple of other people. Uh, I think Caitlin Deschel's done it before. Uh, I think Singa uh, no, Singa won two in one night. Um, I think Danny Edkins done it before. Uh, there might be a couple of others. But anyway, so in, in, in elite company to have won three U.S. Opens in one night. And I remember, because I was still a junior, they were running the Adult Weapons Grand, which was the last event of the night. And, you know, I'm in the back and I, you know, celebrating with my family and everything and, you know, hugs everywhere and all that. And um, this dude in a headset runs up to me wearing an ESPN polo and he's like, hey, we need you uh, up, at the, up at the broadcasting booth in like 30 seconds. And I'm like, well, the last event is going up. He's like, yeah, yeah, the last event's going to end early and we're going to have a little bit more time. So just come up to the booth. And I'm like, okay, sounds good. And so, you know, he like leads me like through like the backside of the crowd and everything. We get to the broadcasting booth where Mike Chat and ESPN commentator R. Caitlin Deschel was up there as well. And then um, we get up into the broadcasting booth and I've got like a one-on-one -on -one interview live on ESPN. And one thing that a lot of people don't realize, so the cool part was the fact that like I was doing an interview live on ESPN, which is the coolest thing in the world, right? 
But what's crazy about this story, and what a lot of people don't realize is, because you know, you see the athletes like put on a headset sometimes, especially when they go up into the broadcasting booth. And so they, they put me in the headset and everything. And what a lot of people don't realize is the headset isn't just there so that you have a microphone there for you. The headset is also there because you have a producer in your ear the entire time giving you little cues, right? So there were like three questions that were going to be asked to me. And I was like in the middle of answering the first question. And then all of a sudden I get a producer in my, in my ear being like, all right, you've got 15 seconds. Go ahead and wrap this question up so we get to the next. And I'm like getting these instructions while I'm trying to answer these questions. So not only did I not know that I was going to get interviewed and now I'm on live TV getting interviewed. I don't know what questions are getting thrown at me. I'm trying to answer the questions, but I also got a producer in my ear telling me how much time I got left to answer the questions, trying to prep me for the next question at the same time. 10 million things are going on, but I wouldn't have traded it for anything. That was a super cool experience. Um, yeah, that, that was just one of the coolest things uh, with those couple of interview stories from ESPN uh, at the U.S. Open. Um, another really cool individual moment. This one doesn't have as much of a story attached to it per se. Uh, but I remember my first time attending the martial arts super show. Um, it was very recently or like during, during the process of Paul Mitchell and Century partnering for Century to be Paul Mitchell's apparel sponsor. Uh, and I remember I was one of the only Paul Mitchell guys at the super show that year. And I actually had a slot in the opening ceremonies to do a completely solo demo. So I got to actually just go out and do my form for the crowd uh, and it was at the Venetian Theater which is like a super famous place to perform in Las Vegas literally on the Las Vegas Strip doing a performance on the Venetian Theater stage was just such a cool experience. Uh, it was a full house. I remember the crowd being great, um, super professional lighting setup and everything and, and it was just absolutely um it's surreal to be out there. I mean, it was just crazy. And that, that, like I said, that one doesn't really have a story to it. But just being able to perform on that type of a stage where you're not competing and you're literally just performing for other people, that was a really, really cool moment. Uh, and then going, I've got only two more here that I want to discuss. So another one, and this is probably the best, let me rephrase that, the second best feeling that I've ever had in my life. The number one best feeling that I've ever had, like individual feeling in a moment. The number one best feeling that I've ever had in my life was proposing to Gabrielle. You know, telling Gabrielle that she was the love of my life and that I wanted to marry her and be with her forever. That's the that's the best feeling that I've ever felt. And I'm sure that that'll be, you know, replaced by getting married and one day having kids and all that. But anyway, uh, the second best feeling, like the instantaneous emotion, like the second best feeling that I've ever had in my life was the first time that I ever performed the Chris Angel. This was at Warrior Cup in 2013. And for those of you that don't know what the Chris Angel is, the Chris Angel is the name of the move where I throw the bow from behind the back and I catch the bow on the back of my hand. Now, in 2020, this move is very routine. A lot of kids do this move. When I perform this move, I always have to do some type of upgrade or variation of it because the original installment of the move has just been seen too many times and too many people have figured it out. However, we're talking about seven years ago. And sport karate is a sport that progresses very, very quickly. So the amount of innovation that has happened in weapons and bow staff in particular over that seven year span is ridiculous, right? So we're going back to 2013, really when bow tricking was starting to have this big resurgence. There had been one major wave of bow staff tricking uh, with the body rolls when body rolls were first invented by Ross Levine, Nate Andrade. And then kind of this, the second wave was the wave of releases, which got kicked started by guys like Corey Lutkus and that kind of continued and one of the continuations of that was the Chris Angel and it was one of those moves where when I did the Chris Angel the first time people had no idea how it had happened like people there were people that legitimately thought like there was some type of trick like some type of magic trick going on when I was doing that technique even though it's you know it's it's physics and it's explainable and it's a move that I actually do and that other people can actually do now but in that moment, you know, in, in my years in sport karate, there's certain tricks. Um, Cal Machoka's double sword releases had this effect. Um, and I'm, I'm having a hard time coming up with other examples. But there's these moves throughout sport karate history where someone does that move 
and you don't hear an immediate roar from the crowd. Like you do a cool move on stage, the crowd will cheer, right? Especially if it's like an electric crowd, like a Diamond Nationals crowd or a Quebec Open crowd, right? But there's some moves that are so special and so unique that you hear silence. And everybody goes quiet. And then right after that silence, there's this crescendo. And then all of a sudden, there's this wave of erupting cheers that happens. Because people go through this thought process of, that's not actually happening. That can't actually be happening. Oh my God, he actually did that. And then they cheer and appreciate it. And so doing the Chris Angel for the first time in 2013, that very first time that the bow hit the back of my hand and I brought that bow across the front of the ring, showing that it was balanced on the back of my hand coming out of that release and hearing that silence. And then when I close my hand and grasp the bow to finish the form and hearing that crescendo, it is exhilarating. I I still, I put myself back in that moment all the time because that is one of the best emotions I've ever felt in my life. And then being able to repeat it again six months later at the U.S. Open that same year when I went ahead and upgraded it to the Mind Freak. So for Mind Freak is one of the shows that Chris Angel used to do. So naturally, the upgrade to the Chris Angel is called the Mind Freak. And for the Mind Freak, what I did was, and at this point, six months after the first Chris Angel happened, people still hadn't really figured out how you did the Chris Angel. So people were still trying to figure that out. So I was still getting great crowd reaction for the Chris Angel. But at US Open that year, I wanted to make a statement uh, because I was going to win the big three that year. I believe I did wind up winning the big three that year, the Warrior Cup, the US Open, and the Diamond Ring. Um, And so anyway, um, I, I really wanted to make a statement win at that US Open. And so at US Open, I uh, I decided to go ahead and upgrade, and the upgrade was to do the Chris Angel, but instead of catching it on the back of my hand, catch the bow balanced only on my index finger, and bring that across the front. And when I did that, it was the same thing that I felt in Chicago at the Warrior Cup, where it was that silence and then that that crescendo to that thunderous uh, cheer. Um, But this time it was US Open. So the crowd was a little bit bigger. The moment was a little bit more intense. It was televised. There's a record of it. Like you can go back and watch the broadcast of it. And, And that's just one of my favorite things in the world is feeling that emotion. That's one of the coolest things that I've ever felt. Um, in, in my entire career of doing sport karate in my entire life, one of the most special things that I've ever felt. Um, and then the last memory uh, is something that's actually more recent. And um, I just wanted to throw this one in there because of how incredibly humbling it is and, and, and how sometimes I just can't even believe that it's a reality. Uh, but that was last year being inducted into the Black Belt Magazine Hall of Fame. And, you know, that is, I mean, being inducted into the Black Belt Hall of Fame is, I mean, it's, it's something that every martial artist dreams of, not even just competitive martial artists, just martial artists dream of having that opportunity. You know what I mean? Like that's, you know, Chuck Norris is in that Hall of Fame, like Bruce Lee is in that Hall of Fame. And like he even, you know, like, I mean, it's just insane to think about the fact that like I am in the Black Belt Magazine Hall of Fame. Like it's just crazy to me that that's a reality. And to think that, that you know, people look at my career and be able to see that much impact as young as I am, it's, I mean, sometimes I'm just speechless because it's, you know, I'm, I'm so humbled by it and I'm so honored by it and I, I'm just so grateful to, to the people at Black Belt Magazine that made that possible and that made that decision and that, and that thought that I was worthy uh, of that type of honor. And so I needed to throw that one in there because of just how, how big of an individual accomplishment that was for me. Um, and just how special that felt. Um, because, you know, 20 years from now, nobody will ever remember, you know, how many Warrior Cups I won or how many U.S. Opens I had. I'll certainly remember, but not everybody will. Um, but, you know, being in a Hall of Fame, that's something that's 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 long term. That's something that's permanent. Like you're you're immortalized by a Hall of Fame. And that's um, man. Just think about it. Like it gives me chills. Just think about it right now. And it's just so crazy. Um, 
And so, yeah, that was the last little memory that I wanted to mention. Now we're going to go ahead uh, and do a quick little ad for Century Signature Weapons. Century Martial Arts offers three Signature Series weapons by Team Paul Mitchell Athletes. Myself, Jackson Rudolph with Signature Series Bow Staffs. Mackenzie Emery with Signature Series Commas. And Danny Etkin with Signature Series Nunchucks. These are top quality products manufactured by G-Force Weapons and sold by Century. Uh, They're all designed to these athletes' specific specifications that we like to use in competition to give you the best performance results, head on over to CenturyMartialArts.com and search any of our names in the search bar to check out Century Signature Weapons and Equipment today. And now moving on into our last little segment, we are going to do a tournament talk segment today. This one's just going to be real brief, not actually talking about a specific event, but announcing a new project that I'm working on in coordination with Century Martial Arts and Black Belt Magazine, and that is the new Facebook page, and it is Martial Arts Events and Tournaments, and then dash hyphen, Black Belt Magazine. So one more time, I'm going to say that again. The title of the page is Martial Arts Events and Tournaments hyphen black belt magazine Uh, and this is a new page uh, where the vision is basically to try to have one source where you can go to find tournaments in your area to see recaps of previous tournaments that have been happening large tournaments so you can see who the athletes are who's out there winning who's out there inspiring as well as to see what other big tournaments are coming up it's basically going to be a landing page for where anybody that wants to get involved in competition or anybody that wants to follow competition. It's also going to have some seminar content and just overall martial arts event content on there as well. But it's basically a place where competitors and martial artists in general can go to get information. Uh, It's basically going to be a news source uh, for sport karate and for competitive martial arts and for martial arts events in general um, where you can see upcoming events, upcoming seminars, uh, all things of that nature. Um, We're starting off with it as a page right now, seeing, experimenting, seeing what types of content people like, seeing what types of content people are responsive to. If there's anything in particular that you would like to see on that page, feel free to shoot me a direct message and I can see what I can do to make that happen or at least try to incorporate that a little bit into the page. Uh, so once again, go ahead and head on over to that page and give it a like. It is Martial Arts Events and Tournaments hyphen Black Belt Magazine. Please go check that out. Drop a like. It's a project that I'm working on that I'm really excited about centuries excited about it black belt magazines excited about it um, and we're excited to see where it goes so if you're a promoter if you're a competitor if you're a parent of a competitor you definitely want to be on that page so head on over and drop a like on that page uh, and i'm super excited about it um, so once again thank you guys very much for tuning in thank you to everybody that wished me a happy birthday i hope you enjoyed taking a little trip down memory lane uh, and hearing some of my favorite memories in sport karate over these 22 years that i've had on this planet uh, and again thank you all so much for the support. Thank you for tuning into the podcast. If you enjoyed it, drop a comment down below, share the podcast. I appreciate you guys and uh, I'll see you next time on the Jax Rudolph podcast.